draft science video on the subject of physics. Yeah. Anyway, still on light and diffraction. So, um, still talking about the Feynman video. I guess I might as well um, put that on the screen or something. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, it's a different Feynman video. Um, you know, they have the, they, I'll post a link. It's one video that has the whole six hours from Auckland, uh, New Zealand. Um, you know, which is, the, the first three or four of those segments were pretty good. The last one, uh, was kind of a waste of time where he just went on about gluons and poons and shuons and nuons and, you know, it's all, ooh, whatever, okay, fine. But, you know, there's not really, not much value in that. Anyway. Curious that comments are disabled on this video. Anyway, it's just nice to have it all in one big pile. So that's all I'm saying. So uh, this is um, starting the second. He did four lectures, I think. Um, you know, hour long kind of things. And it comes out to six hours. I don't know exactly how that works, but whatever. It doesn't really matter. Maybe there's five. Maybe there's six lectures. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't point is, I've seen them many times, a couple of, you know, some of them more than once, um, but you keep looking for things, you know, and, and you start understanding some of this, and so you start to see where he's going, and you start to see why he's going there, and so you start to understand some of this stuff. So anyway, if, if this is for people who are familiar with some of this stuff, I suppose, um, I'm, I'm going to get to apertures in, in, soon. That, that's what I want to talk about, and, um, it's just very interesting, this whole subject of, as you make an opening smaller, what it does to what happens um, when light interacts, um, and the proportions that that happens in and all this kind of stuff. But there's a part in this video, uh, this, this lecture, okay, where Feynman is explaining his, you know, put the two vectors head to tail, get the radius of your probability circle. So he's reducing a sine wave uh, of a regular pattern into a clock, which, you know, a pattern's a pattern, right? So it makes sense. <clears throat> As I've stated in the other video, you know, in a way a sine wave is what a round thing would produce if you put a piston on it. You know, it'll produce circles can be turned into up and down uh, uh, correlated things. Um, correlate. There's so many words that are just so interesting. Uh, you know, collinated light. <laughs> I, I, whatever. That's the, 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 the what I'm going to talk about with. with it's just like it you know, moves in a parallel. Anyway. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't have any conclusions in this video, I don't think. I just have, um, I, you know, I'm just forming, and I just thought I'd, be, I'd make a video um, just on observations. So anyway, so, so something I've not observed before when Feynman talks about his clock, because I really didn't, I didn't have a deep enough understanding of exactly what he was representing with the clock, is the clock is basically representing the speed of the clock, how often this pattern repeats and the real trick is is this clock is going very very fast it, 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 you know uh, 70 times 10 to the 27th or whatever some kind of wacky number and as I stated before I was talking about atoms and their spacing you know and, and how you, you know there's a fact where you, there's something that's 10 atoms thick and then there's something that's 11 atoms thick but there's no such thing as 10 and a half atoms thick kind of a thing. And that's sort of what this probability thing is representing, is what happens when you start having that half of an atom distance. <laughs> or the, you know, this is where, this is what's creating this probability, is, is whether you're hitting atoms that are, you could say, comfortable versus uncomfortable and that atoms get uncomfortable when you attempt to stretch them or some I mean there's probably a word to use for an atom that's in its regular state versus this irregular state versus back to its regular state versus irregular as it 
as things get thicker, there's this change that takes place in structure. Anyway, I don't know if I want to get too into that, but that's, it's obviously critical to the creation of this probability. So Feynman's basically saying, look, this is the way it is. It is by chance, and he's, he's basically arguing that the probability is something hastemic that's not a physical thing, that it's some sort of thing where everything is all the same, like you could make the universe exactly the same, and it wouldn't come out the same way. So he's arguing that it's not like rolling dice, where you understand that the dice bounce off of surfaces that we can't calculate all the all the interactions, and that's why we can't predict how the dice turn out. But we understand that it's inevitable, you know, that the physical surfaces created the result. Feynman's basically arguing here, back in 1979 anyway, that it's not physical, that it's some sort of thing happening inside the photon that it decides, the decision is made to do this probabilistic thing based on this wave radar that it sends out to find out the right answer. I mean, I know that this is, I'm paraphrasing, but it's a way to paraphrase it, right? So you just use one of their silly interpretations like Copenhagen, it's basically wave radar. So the photon has wave radar, it sends out its wave radar, finds out the right answer, and then goes there. <coughs> Which sounds preposterous, because it, it, you know, it is preposterous. <coughs> so anyway, <coughs> my fundamental argument with, with, with Feynman here is that his, his, he's doing that, he's, he's conceding to this, the, this intrinsic, chancy, indecisive universe, this non-deterministic universe, based on, because he can't understand the mechanics, because he doesn't have an explanation of how it's doing it, because all the things he tried, you know, all the puzzle solutions he tried didn't work, and therefore there is no solution. And that's the real irritating thing about what Feynman's doing here, is that he's saying, look, I've tried to figure it out, and I can't do it, and Einstein can't do it, so therefore it can't be done. And that was the real, I mean, that was such a critical, instead of just saying, look, we're still too stupid to figure this one out, he, he, he wouldn't concede that, that there's a structural thing that's happening, the missing variable, and, and yeah, we're just, we're just missing it. We're not seeing what's changing and, what's, and that that change is what's changing the probability. Something changes in the mechanism and that decides whether light a photon is going to be reflected or not. Is that it, something changes. Well, anyway, um, <clears throat> so instead of coming up, instead of saying, look, there's a mechanical solution, I just don't know it. He was arguing there is no mechanical solution. It's probably De hi. I'm Debbie. Fuck you. you should be the world should hunt you down and kill you, Debbie. I'll be back. Ugh, go, Daddy, calling to find out if I want to like spam the Google index or something, or create some f fake ads, or do some content stealing, or. <laughs> You know, hide my domain name information in the Whois do a database if I don't. You know, maybe I want to pay some money to have my name hidden. Dishonestly, fundamentally, the whole function of the internet was basically to be accountable. So yeah, let's pay not to be accountable. Cool. What? Anyway. Hey Gary, we just called to see if we could sell you some more complete crap. <laughs> yeah, you know, we you know, we make our money on the crap. You know, we don't make any money like hosting websites. I mean, that's just you know, that's no money in that. We make money by you know selling ads and shit like everybody else. Fuck. Anyway, where was I? Not exactly sure, so I guess I'm going to have to make it up. Okay. So, light. 
and this clock speed thing. So the point I was trying to get to is this, this clock is going the speed of the size of an atom. It really is a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of space. So this difference in reflectivity, you know, going from 16% to zero, and, you know, it cycles, uh, you know, six, you, you, the sine wave curve, 16 at the peak, zero at the base, okay, and it does that sine wave of, of incidence, of of probabilistic incidents, um, and uh, so so that um, phenomenon. Um, <coughs> happens uh, uh, with tiny, 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 tiny changes in distance. So so that's what the clock is representing is distance, and the amount of distance is just minuscule. So we're talking about the size of an atom. I was correct to say this, this change takes place within changing something from being 10 atoms thick to being 11 atoms thick. That's the size of this clock spin. So the distance you change going from 10 atoms to 11 atoms is the distance of one turn of the clock of this vector change of probability. And so the entire, um, so, so in the two-slit experiment, for example, the, the <coughs> place that you'll have these divisions, the spacing, will be changed through a whole cycle, a cycle of shift and shift back again. You could see it that way, maybe. This position going to this position, this posi you know, different positions, and then back to that position, kind of for the dark lines, you could say, happens with these minute changes in the size of the opening. So little tiny movement changes, you know, has, has a whole cycle of effect. So that's why, you know, when you look at these double slit experiments, you see a lot of that when you vibrate it at all or change it, it just, you know, the, the, this, the, the, there's a lot of movement in the in the in the, in the um, product. Let's call it. All right. So, um, so where was I? Okay. So, um, all right. So yeah. So I'll just get to the collinated light thing. All right. So there's, there's this idea that light comes in two varieties, right? The the regular light that's coming in from all directions. And this idea of light that's all moving the same way. So a laser would be a representation of light all moving parallel to each other. Now apparently though, regular diode lasers, you know, the common ones used, they're not so collinated. So at a distance, yeah, their dot does get bigger. So you can sort of get the idea that the light does have a little bit of angularity to it. Um, and it's only when you use these gas lasers of certain kinds that you get really good collinated light. So at 50 feet, the dot would be the same size, you know, kind of thing. Anyway, um, and the, the interesting thing about these apertures, okay, so apertures just making a hole bigger and smaller, um, is that the smaller it gets, the, the more it shoots light and, you know, the the, the more it cones the light, and the wider it is, the less it cones the light. So that's an interesting fact. And it's more interesting is, the straighter the light goes in, the more likely the light is to be diffracted. So if the light goes in straight and into a small aperture, it'll come out diffracted, which is an interesting fact, that straight light encountering a surface, you know, light going in a straight pattern is more substantially diffracted. And the more angularly the light comes in, the less likely it is to be substantially diffracted. That's, it appears. The more likely it is to be collinated by the aperture. The aperture will actually straighten the light coming in at an angle. So, I don't know if I can really draw that. Let's give it a shot. Um, so, so here we, we got this idea that the, the small, the wide opening doesn't create much diff diffraction. And the 
near tiny little opening creates a lot of diffraction. Now, the, this could just be representing that there's plenty of diffraction here, but you'll never see it, okay, because it's a small percentage of the overall light is going against the surfaces. So the wider the aperture, the lower percentage of light, right, so the percentage of the light hitting the surface is much smaller overall, so it's totally drowned it out. And the smaller the aperture, the higher the, so the percentage is way down here, and the percentage of light hitting or, or going near the, the aperture is really high. So you have a high percentage of the light goes near the surface when it's small, and a low percentage when it's big. So that's one fact. <clears throat> the other fact is, is that it seems the straighter the light is coming in, yeah, the more likely it is to diffract, which is curious. I mean, this is one I'm not quite sure of, but I mean, that's what it appears to be as, as a fact. I guess that's why lasers are very good at creating this diffraction pattern, because they have this more of this collinated light, which means there's more straight light hitting these surfaces, you know, going right next to these surfaces. So as I'm thinking about it, okay, obviously the, the point I'm making is that Here's the, let's say this is the surface of the open slit, right? Well, let's just, so we're making it big. What we really do, we need to do is make it huge. And then we understand that there's a bunch of atoms here with electrons, you know, little electrons buzzing around. And that that is what the light is inter interacting with, is this, 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 uh, when it, it's interacting with the surface, it's interacting with a field of electrons, and um, you know, the, and the key point is this corner, right? So you could argue that this is the key, the key place in here might be this corner where this this electron in the corner might be the furthest out electron, and so it might be the one that's doing this diffracting um, in some way. You could also argue that there is literally a field created around a charge, that these things are automatic. Everything's charged in some way or another. It's all, everything's got a charge. It's just either positive or negative, but it's always, it's a, everything has a charge that's always vibrating. Between, like, say if you had a neutral charge, that would just mean that your electron is here, okay, is... is <laughs> yeah, better to draw it this way, I suppose. Um, a neutral charge, say this is the uh, typical atom, a neutral charge really means is you're half the time, okay, the electrons here, and the other half, it's over on this side, and it's over on these two sides exactly even. But the real fact is, is that your charge is, is that this electron, when this electron's over here, you're positively charged because the, the proton is positively charged. So you're negatively charged when it's here, and you're positively charged when it's here. So your charge is constantly fluctuating. And if all your atoms aren't doing the same thing, you know, they're at a different stage in their orbits, obviously, then the net charge would be what we call a neutral charge but it's not really neutral. You're flashing a charge, <laughs> okay? You're, it's on and off, on and off, on and off, on and off. It's an alternating charge um, where we see it as like more of a DC, more of a, more of a, um, a real charge when there's a predominance. So when your atoms are imbalanced and the electron's spending more time over one side than it spends on the other side of the proton, then we call you negatively charged, and when the inverse, we call you positively charged. But you always have a charge. I'm just arguing that there's always a field you're creating. It's just that the field is in flux. It's constantly turning, essentially, on and off um, when you're electrically neutral. I mean, even when you're not electrically neutral, it's fluctuating. Um, but anyway, that doesn't really matter.
to some extent. Okay. Um, so where do, where do I want to go? So so anyway, so it just seems like this is the key. I think there's probably this corner is where the action is. This this corner is where decisions are being made when it comes to light. But it certainly could be that this you know, reflective index has something to do with it in terms of reflecting off of the 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 interior of the material. Could also have something to do with it. I don't know. Um, it gets into complex questions because you start talking about now how thick the material is of the slit, which can be very thin, like just a film of carbon. Um, but we're also talking about very thin slits sometimes too. Um, but this certainly would change what angle would be possible. And these angles clearly aren't angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. That certainly isn't happening to create the typical diffraction of an aperture. You know. so, so, so what's happening is the aperture, you know, this picture is a good representation. I mean, the light goes in with this tiny little opening whatever light hits it from whatever angles. Um, but see, that's part of the trick here, is that they use an aperture in the two-slit experiment. So the two-slit experiment is done with an aperture here. So the light is coned at the two slits. And by being coned, that means that it has already built into it this pattern of on and off. It's already built in. And who knows what that's doing this pattern, you know, that gets projected through these two slits that are also coning the light, essentially. And so now you're doubled up on your diffraction that you already created back here. Uh, so it's now double diffracted light, um, which I've talked about that before, too. So anyway, so the key thing is, is the understanding that the probability is a reflection of something happening at a very small level. Very tiny changes um, re-initiate the cycle. So there's, in the, two, in, in the diffraction pattern, you probably have tiny, tiny little marks inside of each one of the marks. You know, it's almost like a fractal. So like your bands of light probably have subdivisions that are also, and then subdivisions, and then subdivisions. But I, won't, I don't even want to get into that. Um, I don't know whether that's been illustrated or not. See, it's hard to tell. Like, when you see the experiment done, where they vary things, um, I need to slow them down or do something to try to see what is actually happening when things change. And you would think that physicists would be pretty obsessed with visualizing that. You know, it's just kind of funny that they've taken things like a bullet breaking a light bulb and they've used strobes and all this work to try to get you know frozen pictures of those things and they haven't thought to do the same thing with their light experiments where <laughs> you know that's what you really need is to slow this down make tiny changes and see how everything changes but anyway so that's just another comment I'm just surprised physicists aren't more interested in dissecting the mechanics of apertures in the fact that they're doing something really quite bizarre and you'd think they would want to account for why it's doing it. Um, Alright, um, so do I have anything to add? So like I said, this is just where I, where I am. I'm just at the, the, <coughs> the key thing I got was Okay, Feynman right here in this video. I mean, I, I could go back to like here and play the part, but he basically just concedes the clock's going around really fast, and he used a number like 70 times 10 to the minus 12th, or I mean the 12th or something. I mean, hugely big number to represent how many times a second this clock is spinning. And so that was a real giveaway that we're talking about changes tiny, tiny, tiny changes uh, that represent the entire cycle of probability. And so that these changes are happening on a very, very, very minute scale, at atomic style changes.
Um, <clears throat> I guess I should also point out, like when he was talking about how there's no explanation for this, he was using some kind of explanations. He was saying, well, what if there's spots on the glass and that decides whether it reflects, you know, 4% or, I mean, it reflects or it doesn't reflect tiny little spots we can't see or something. And then he was talking about light itself being a football, you know, and that it hits the surface a different way. So when it hits on the point, it reflects. When it hits on its side, it doesn't. And that accounts for the 1 in 25 times that it bounces off is because that's the time it hit on the point. Here's a, a clear analogy would be, well, if you took it, he said, and he says that won't work because obviously they take the light that went through, it should be on point, but it doesn't reflect off the next surface. So obviously it's not on point. Obviously the light isn't the thing that was doing the reflecting. And, but the, I'm just saying the thing that he obviously missed is just to say, well, what if the atoms have a shape? And depending on what shape the atom is that the photon hits, decides whether it reflects or doesn't reflect. I don't think you're going to be able to eliminate that as being the possibility that as you change the thickness of the glass, you change the shape of the atoms on the surface. That sounds reasonable. But see, he just didn't, he just gave up and said, no, we're, going to, we're stopping here at trying to explain it. And that was just, wasn't very scientific of him, I guess. Um, <clears throat> and especially when you consider how emphatic they are about saying, we're declaring this a, a fact of nature that there, that again, I mean, he's basically saying there's no atomic determinism, which I think is just, I mean, it's such a bold statement. And to base it on such a weak investigation of the experiment you're using as an excuse for it. <clears throat> I mean, I don't know why this doesn't occur to people. Logical people, reasonable people should say, yeah, this was not nearly thorough enough a trial to convict um, whatever, the universe of not being deterministic. Uh, so, so anyway, um, some work needs to be done. Um, so I did want to, I just want to get back to this orbit thing, right, real quick while we're talking about Adam. So, <coughs> another key thing, you know, and Hathaway doesn't quite get this, I don't think, is the, the universe is just so dense with this stuff. Like I said, there is no orbits. Orbits are an illusion. You know, the, the gravity that's holding atoms together, the forces... I mean, it's happening on every single, every single move that this takes, you know, this orbiting thing, the thing spinning around. Every single time, it has to be hit by something and essentially replaced. So it's going, let's say it's, it wants to go this way. It has to get hit. This thing replaces it. This one goes off and leaves. And this replacement and is now in control, is now cutting in. And then this gets, see where this one went out this way? Well, the atom next to this has this thing coming out of it this way. And that thing coming out of it this way ends up hitting this and knocking this back into the orbit. So as the orbit's collapsing, you know, as it's doing this elasing, it's, a, it's really quite complex, the, the, the whole function here that's happening. When you think about the fact that it keeps getting knocked out, it realistically is getting knocked in and out of an orbit. It's not ever in the right orbit. It's always in the wrong place. <laughs> but probabilistically, over time, because of the, the, the stuff coming in, it will inevitably keep getting pushed in. So essentially what, you're, you know, what I'm arguing is, is that when you're in that field of pressure, you just can't escape the pressure. It's coming from all sides unless there's something blocking it. But the point is, is that pressure will inevitably keep knocking that one vector of straight line. So the original, say the original thing comes in and has one vector of straight line that one vector of straight line will just keep getting 
you know, overwhelmed by the, um, how to say that, this evening out pressure. Um, that's just this constant nagging. That's not the way to say it. Well, I'll think on that. But but the point is, is that the orbit is not an orbit. It's a, it's a thing created by forces pushing things into these positions. So the Earth is, the atoms inside the Earth are, you know, they're going that way. They, they, they're not they're not orbiting. They're just being, and then they're being knocked into the orbit by the universe's pressure. Now, the, blocking pressure created by the sun. All right, well, that's enough for that, for, for now. Yeah. So I have to do some work on this aperture thing. Um, that, you know, I hate that I have to, you know, I, I, it's a whole learning curve. So, I mean, you can spend so much time working, figuring out lensing, um, you know, the distances between the, you know, the object and the focus and, you know, figuring out all, you know, there's a lot to figure out here. Um, and um, very curious, but it's kind of a like focus is a good idea, a way to look at it. See, like the lenses of a microscope, you can see that the last couple of lenses are basically just taking the the big crooked image that comes in, <coughs> bending it to the focus, you know, the ap tiny aperture of your eyepiece, and basically doing that just the right place where now the light can be recollated back into parallel light to shoot into your eye. You know, so it's crooked light, parallel light, crooked light, parallel light. I mean, that's what all this lensing is doing, is it's making light that's parallel, then unparallel, then parallel, then unparallel, going through all these lenses in a way just to end up taking something there and bringing it here um, <sighs> enlarged. Uh, yeah. Well, anyway, you spend a lot of time becoming an expert on just that function alone. Just that, the idea of what's happening each time light is interfered with by material. <laughs> yeah, it really is interesting. Anyway, till next time. Touch.